Welcome to the Sunday morning session. Our first speaker today is Harvey Fiala. He's been part of the family now for quite some time. I met him in 2004. I've been very thankful to know him. He's put together one DVD in particular, his 2005 lecture at uh, the conference. If you have a little extra to put into, to invest in DVDs, definitely get that one. He talked about measurement and it is a very, very powerful piece and really helps a lot of people. Um, it says he started experimenting with Grant's uh, uh, gravity at age of eight in his father's basement. He ended up getting a master's degree in electrical engineering from the California Institute of Technology. He's been working in this field for uh, quite a uh, super long time and, and just really knows his stuff. And let's all welcome Harvey Fiala. So it doesn't matter where I stand then. Okay. Good morning. As he mentioned, my name is Harvey Fiala. And <clears throat> I'm going to start, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. Uh, I have 12 slides that I'm going to go through quickly. Then there's a short video that I'm going to go through quickly. Then there's a PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to go through quickly. And uh, then I'm going to go through the 12 slides toward the end slowly and elaborating on each one. Then I'll go through the video and we'll repeat that several times. And I'll elaborate on different parts of the video. And then at the end, <clears throat> we have a device here which uh, actually works. It's an inertial propulsion for providing horizontal motion. I called HMT IPD. Horizontal motion by mass transfer. IPD is inertial propulsion device. <clears throat> and uh, it's really an honor to be here uh, at this conference. It's a privilege and an honor and uh, I appreciate it, and <clears throat> I have uh, I have a lot of health issues with with myself actually. But when I come to this conference, I feel energized. I feel much better, and I can walk better, which is which is amazing. And uh, it's so full of I'll say positivity and different health uh, uh, cures and so forth. So <clears throat> I just feel a lot better and. Uh, by the way, I did the life, life something uh, on a table out there. He put a patch on my, I have a bad hip. He put a patch on front of my belt and on the back of my belt. And, and I start walking a lot better now, so I don't have my big, big heavy belt on today, which is amazing. So I, those things really work. <clears throat> and uh, I might mention that I, I got this master's degree from the California Institute of Technology, so I had six years of college, and not once that I can recall did a book or a professor ever mention the name Tesla. Now, figure that out, huh? Why? Why is it like that? Uh, that's that's uh, uh, that that's sad. <clears throat> and. There's something called the Gravity Research Foundation. They used to be in New Hampshire, uh, New Boston, New Hampshire, something like that. And they have an annual contest. It's right now, it's $5,000 for first place, but they, their goal was to start out with a way to control gravity, uh, an essay. And, um, and uh, <clears throat> okay, thank you. And, it turns out that this device 
is the very, very first approach that controls gravity. It can, gravity is a downward force, and this converts to a sideways motion, which is not supposed to be possible, according to all the physicists. And it's also supposed to be impossible to convert rotary motion to unidirectional linear motion. Well, this does, this does that also. And uh, <clears throat> I want to mention that, well, there's over 50 different patents that claim to move and produce a force. And I've studied them all, and they, they do not work. They cannot work. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, the first one that had received any attention was the Dean Drive. It came out in 1960. It was published in Astounding Science Fiction, and it was amazing, a great story. And it was so convincing that it really worked. And I ordered a copy of that patent, and I studied it. <clears throat> and actually, I was just graduated from Caltech, and Dr. Richard Feynman, the Nobel laureate, uh, and he, to me, he's the best instructor on the planet, or was, now he's deceased. But I took this Dean Device patent to him, and we studied it. And he showed me a general rule to tell uh, uh, you, any device like this, you can break it up into two parts. There's the moving part, the, the rotor, the gyro. That's called the active mass. All the rest of it is called the passive mass. And you can break this up into two components, the active and the passive. And the, the active mass moves round and round. The passive mass is at the center, the center, the center of gravity or center of mass of the chassis is dead center here. And so this really has only two components. <clears throat> and, and Dr. Feynman said, move the thing 45 degrees and plot the center of mass of the active and the passive. M move, it, move it another 45 and repeat it. Do it every 45 until you get a full circle around. And at each of those points, you plot the center of mass of the combined active and passive mass. And when you do that, it didn't move. And it cannot move without the application of an external force. Uh, and, and this de first device that does not require an external force. Actually, it does require an external force. The external force is gravity. Gravity moves straight down. That's what causes the precession. And, and, uh, but it converts a downward force to horizontal motion. And it's so obvious, it's so simple that some of the mo most simplest things are ones you overlook. And, and I finally figured that part out. One thing about this, <clears throat> it, it precesses 180 degrees and uses traction 180 degrees. Precession 180, but it goes in uniform circular motion. That's very important. There's no jerking or anything like that. The, the, the active mass goes in uniform circular motion on the chassis, but now the chassis is moving under it as a reaction to the, the motion of the mass, of the active mass. <clears throat> a few months ago, Dr. Tom Vallone, who he used to come to the INA meetings and, and uh, uh, he publishes a lot of books, and he has a, he's head of the Institute of Research, Research Institute. And he has a monthly newsletter, and he stated that <clears throat> finally inertial propulsion is here. And he pointed out that uh, uh, some satellites have inertial propulsion, and it's based on the Dean drive. And I looked at that and said, wow. Well, I worked, and it said that Boeing has had inertial propulsion for over 10 years, and the patents expired, so anyone can build it now. And that, that was all wrong. That was reported to him by a journalist who 
the journalist thought he knew what he was doing or either he altered the facts. But uh, Boeing actually has, it's called electric propulsion and it uses an ion engine. An ion, and it uses a xenon. Xenon has the highest specific impulse of any propellant uh, so far. And, <clears throat> you know, like the space shuttle uses a million pounds of liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, and puts it together and <clears throat> it, it uses propellant, something like 5,000 pounds per second, it spits it out. That lifts the space shuttle up. And, uh, and that, to me, that's a brute force way of propelling something. It's like you have seven astronauts sitting up there on top of a bomb. If something goes wrong, you all know the rest of the story. And so that's a brute force way. And, and inertial propulsion does not use a propellant. It uses energy. For example, you have to turn the rotor. So it, it uses energy, no propellant. And the energy, if you have a solar cell, it's not going to run out of sunlight, not, not in this solar system. If you're going from planet to planet or something, you, you still have sunlight. Unless you get out toward Pluto, uh, then the sunlight is very dim. Uh, I want to mention that I have, I have two patents. <clears throat> uh, there's copies of them out on the table. The first patent... Hmm. I, I, does it still work? Yes. The first patent has an orange cover on it. There's a few copies out there. The second... And the orange copy is for horizontal motion. Yes. I'll take this one. Okay. Great, thank you. <clears throat> the second patent has a blue cover, and it's for vertical motion. And <clears throat> the first one requires gravity. The second one, gravity would kill it. It's not designed for use on, in a gravitational field like on a planet. And and it's designed to work out an orbit where there's no gravitational field. Actually, there is a gravitational field out there, but it's canceled by the centrifugal force. It goes round and round the planet, and the centrifugal force uh, is countered by gravity, so they're, it's neutral. And so this, this uh, vertical, the vertical motion device, which I call VMT, uh, can be tested only in the space station. Um, and so this could be one of the reasons, it could be the most important reason to keep the space station running, because they talked about, at first they talked about retiring it in 2015, and now they're going to go to 2020 and <clears throat> and that that's such a expensive and beautiful machine that, uh, that <laughs> imagine deorbiting that and burning it up over the ocean uh, that that would be totally wrong so and here's an inertial propulsion device that needs to be tested actually it needs to be built this is simple to be built but I'll say more about that. The, uh, the vertical motion one, I'll just g give you, g give you a, a glimpse of it. It can be complex, and it needs to be built by, uh, spend $100,000 and build a precision one in a laboratory uh, where, where they have uh, machines, and they can build one to a tolerance of a ten-thousandth of, of an inch. <clears throat> Yes. Thank you. That, that's, that's an example. It looks complicated and looks like it might tip over, but it can't tip over. Why can't it tip over? Because there's no gravitational field, you know. If I built a tall thing here and I bumped it, it could flop over and smash. But that's out in orbit. There's no... Now, you probably wouldn't build one like that, but I, I analyzed dozens of configurations in, uh, in this patent. And I, I'd encourage 
you that are interested in it, go pick up a copy of the blue uh, or the orange or both. And <clears throat> thank you. And uh, there's actually a tutorial in it. If you are seriously interested in, in studying the principles of inertial propulsion, there's a tutorial in it. You can become a student of it and learn it. Yeah, there's a, two examples, figure something or other and something else. Uh, my vision's a little blurry, blurry. Maybe the image is blurry also. <clears throat> I'm going to mention some applications. You know, I started, I was so interested in gravity at the age of eight that in my father's basement I started experimenting. You know, usually you build a wheel with weights on the spokes and you try to get it going around, well, that cannot work. And of course, as a eight-year-old, I, I, I realized that, and I kept doing things. In fact, uh, <clears throat> I became interested in measuring the speed of gravitational interaction. And, <clears throat> and in, in my first physics class in college, after the class was over, I walked up to the professor and I asked him, uh, Professor, what would happen if you way in outer space where there's no bodies around for a light year, put a ping pong ball out there, and then 186,000 miles away, that's how far light travels in one second, 186,000, create a planet instantly, like if you were God. How long is it gonna take for the gravitational field from that newly created planet to reach out and grab a hold of that ping pong ball and start pulling it toward it? And you know what his answer was? He looked at me and said, are you crazy? Okay, you think, think that discouraged me? Well, that just fired me up and made me think. Uh, anyhow, he was a rather simple-minded professor. He was good at what he taught, but his mind couldn't go any further than what he was taught. And, uh, and later on, I wrote an article uh, uh, called Gravity, A New Means of Communication. Uh, and it was published in the North Dakota State Engineer when I was a junior uh, at the North Dakota State University. <clears throat> and, and it was titled, Gravity, a New Means of Communication? Question mark. And the whole uh, theory of that was, if gravity is instantaneous, it would be a very, very good thing for us to learn to use it so we could communicate uh, from one planet to another. Keep talking. Is it? Is not too loud? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, not loud enough. Okay. Just raise it up then. That, that ought to do it. Okay. See, if gravity is changed, we should learn to use it. And actually, this is the first, first way to control gravity that I know of. And I've, I'm going to give some examples of, of the applications of gravity, and these are obvious. First off, a waterfall. Gravity pulls the water down and generates electricity. That's obvious. Another one is a pendulum. You can tell time with the pendulum. Another is the Foucault pendulum. That's a, that's a weird one where, where it's, it's sitting still, but the earth turns under it. And, and it's calibrated in hours. So you, you, if you sit and watch it for a whole, whole hour, you'll see it change from one time to another. Gravity is used to create vortices. You've heard a lot about vortex. Uh, as in, as in a tornado, or even flushing a toilet, or like up in uh, up in Hawaii in Kauai, there's there's a water and you go over a bridge and there's a culvert under there, and the water there's a vortex going under. And that's so beautiful. I took pictures of it. A, build a gravity gradiometer, a gravity sensor. Um, holding the satellites in orbit. With their centrific force, they'd fly away, so gravity holds them in orbit. Uh, 
another unique thing, uh, Dr. Robert Milliken measured the charge on an electron. Uh, uh, he put an electron in a, in a chamber and it was falling down and, and the gravity pulled it down and he determined what charge it took to hold it still. And so it measured the charge on an electron. And uh, <clears throat> by the way, one of the team here married Dr. Milliken's granddaughter, which is, which is interesting. Uh, another very interesting thing is, this is theoretical. If you drilled a hole in the earth straight through and drop something through, it would take exactly 42 minutes to fall all the way through. It speeds up toward the center and comes back to a dead stop at the other side, and then it would just keep oscillating. Or if you build it at any angle, if you drilled a hole from here to New York City, the earth is shaped like this. If you drill the hole, no matter what angle you drill the hole, the, the, fall, the time for gravity to move something through is 42 minutes. That's very interesting. Now, obviously, it would have to be a tunnel. It'd have to be in a vacuum because there would be resistance. That would change the time. But that's an interesting application of it. <clears throat> just, just to estimate a local vertical, Carpenters and builders, they use a plumb bob. Uh, Lag Lagrangian points. If here's the Earth and the Moon, gravity pulls it this way, gravity pulls it this way, and the whole thing rotates around its center of mass, and there's a point out here where the, the centrifugal forces and the pulls of the Earth and the gravity are equal, and so it's stationary. And, and NASA has parked different satellites there just for safekeeping until they have a need for it. And then they, uh, <clears throat> then they fire it up and send it on its way to a planet or to an asteroid or to a comet. And so there's Lagrangian points. There's five, every two bodies has five Lagrangian points. Two of them are stable, the others are unstable. For example, on the far side of the moon, there's an unstable point. Uh, the pull of the m moon and the pull of gravity are exactly canceled by, by the rotation of the two-body system around its own center of mass. And <clears throat> if you're right on that point, it's there. But it's like putting a marble on the top of a curved surface. If you, if you bump it, it rolls away. So it's an unstable point. There's three unstable points and two stable points. And those two stable points happen to be uh, form a 60-degree angle with the two bodies, like an equilateral triangle one on each side. So those are Lagrangian points. Gravitational potential energy, converting it to kinetic energy. I'll, I'll give you an example of that. I told <clears throat> some professors that I, I devised a gravitational starter for our truck and our tractors on the farm. He thought I was nuts. Well, we built a barn and the earth sloped so at the front of the barn I personally, with the little bulldozer, built a grate up there. It was about three or four feet high. But if the, if the battery in the truck was low and it'd go, er, 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 you know, couldn't start it, at the end of the day, before you shut it off, you back it up, put the, put the brakes on, turn the switch off, and stop it. So in the morning, when you want to go, you turn the switch on, you put it in high gear and take the brake off and let it start rolling down. And the, it, it develops speed, that's kinetic energy, and it start turning the engine over and it goes and Then you immediately put the clutch in so it don't l slow down and you uh, uh, put, it, put it out of gear or into, into low gear, whatever you want. But that's a way of converting gravitational potential energy to kinetic energy to do something like start an engine. Eight, this is HMT, horizontal motion by mass transfer. Uh, and there's other applications. Uh, I, I, you know, like a waterfall, there's a, there's a thousand different applications of where something falls and is used by gravity uses it. But I, I try to list unique ones. And obviously there's others that I've missed. 
I have I have two patents. I said, and the and the very interesting thing. I it took me three and a half years to get this patent, and I had to fight the patent office like you you can't imagine, because they will not grant a patent on something called inertial propulsion, because they know it's impossible. All the establishment physicists say that don't even don't even bother reading it because the guy's a crackpot, see? And so uh, I had to change the name of this to a device that moves moves an object back and forth at horizontal motion. And if it moves more in one way than the other, it, it provides motion. And so I had to call it device to uh, move an object back and forth. And for my vertical motion one, I had to call it a device to move an object up and down. And, and then I got them to grant the patent. And uh, that's sad. They were in that same position with regard to cold fusion. And uh, Dr. Tom Vallone was a patent agent uh, for the patent department. And, uh, and he was for cold fusion big time. And, and they fired him because he wanted to get give patents on cold fusion. They fired him. And so he, had, he didn't have a job for three or four years. I mean, he didn't seek one, but he... <clears throat> so he came to all the meetings of like this, which was the Institute for New Energy back in Salt Lake City. And, uh, and uh, I know him very well. His wife, Jackie, Jacqueline, is a PhD in physics also, believe it or not. Uh, and, uh, and so, um, actually, he filed a lawsuit, and so he got he got a settlement and he got back pay. Now he's back there working in the patent department, and uh, and so I have a friend in the patent department, uh, but I could not. It would have been a conflict of interest for him to help me on my patent, so I I had to exercise caution there. <clears throat> It's, it's a, one of their tactics. My, my VMT patent was three-fourths of the way through, and suddenly I got a letter saying they disallowed all claims based on one word. And, and I don't have it memorized, but it was something to the effect that uh, what I have here is the best thing I can find, the best way to do it. Uh, and it, it was obvious that that I had studied all the other ones, but that one sentence didn't explicitly state that, and so they disallowed the whole thing. And I had to, I had to write a letter saying that, look, what, what do you think all these other references are for? And f so they changed their position and allowed it. And uh, and uh, another time, there's a lot of artwork in here. They disallowed it, saying all the all the artwork is too shoddy, too sloppy. And it, it was identical, except for four different figures, it was identical to the ones in the earlier patent which they had already granted. And so they had a, they had a position that was ridiculous. I had to fight all that and finally I got, I got this second patent. I'm just telling you, it's, when, you're, when you're trying to break new ground, uh, the establishment is against you. Now, I want to mention that I stand on the shoulders of two, a giant and a lesser giant. Alex Jones, about, about 1880 or thereabouts, got a device that moved like this, a single stroke one, a single cycle one, and, and you'd have to reset it and it'd, and he demonstrated this to Dr. La Eric Laithwaite. And Dr. Eric Laithwaite was amazed by it. He just, he hadn't, he was working on stuff like maglev, you know, converting, building speedy trains and things like that. And, and he was amazed by it. And, and he actually uh, studied it, gave a guest lecture for the Royal Institute of London. And, and they thought he was, he never said it, they thought he was trying to defy the laws of physics with some magic stunt or something, see? So that, they, they blacklisted him. 
and they did not publish. That's the only one, every year there's one, they didn't publish it, and that is so, so wrong, but it's an example of the establishment physicists, not only in the United States, but in Great Britain and, and wherever. And <clears throat> now, I, I used to correspond with Alex Jones, then he passed away. Then I continued to correspond with his daughter, and his daughter told me that Eric Lathwaite stole Alex Jones' ideas. Uh, Alex Jones, uh, I have a copy of his first patent. It was in German, and I translated it into English. I had German in my first year of college. Then he had a second patent, and he died before that was published. But his daughter gave me copies of his working papers on it, and so I have that. And, but Dr. Lathwaite basically stole his ideas, according to Alex Jones's daughter, and, and uh, Dr. Lathwaite knew what he was doing, and he's a very, very good engineer, electrical engineer, and, and he built a device that should work, but it was so complex that it would be impractical to build one. It could be built, but no, no big company in their right mind would try to manufacture it for production, because it's, it's a Rube Goldberg type thing. Now you see this here, you might say it has only one moving part. And, uh, and, and so, it's, so it, you could say, how simple can it be? Well, that's true, and that's not true. Dr. Lathwaite um, wrote an article called Jabberwock, or something like that. And apparently that's a, something in Alice in Wonderland. It's a, it's a dragon or monster. If you touch it, it bites you. The, and he says, beware of the Jabberwock. And <clears throat> what he meant is that when you're playing with, when you're playing with uh, gyros, uh, unexpected things will happen. And so if, if you try to change any parameter on this thing, it'll bite you. And so it, it, it was so hard. It, it reminds me of a, suppose you had a combination that had 10 numbers this and that and that and that, 10 numbers. Now, I could show my son, who might be 10 years old, to learn to open that, and he could open in a minute. So I could tell any of you brilliant mathematicians and physicists, okay, take this and open it. You could spend a lifetime and not get it. Or you might be so smart that you would get it in a year or two or something, see? and. And I tell him, why does it take you that long? My son can do it in one minute. Well, the secret is <laughs> someone already did it, and they know, they know the answers to it. See, that's the same thing here. And I've gone through all the growing pains on that, and, uh, and it's, it's comparable to a, to a uh, combination that uses 10 different numbers. <clears throat> Okay, converting a downward force to a sideways force is supposed to be impossible, and, and I haven't done that. I convert downward force just to motion, which is not force. And so I've, I've accomplished one thing. Now, another thing, rotary motion, they said you cannot convert it to uni, uni, unidirectional linear motion. Well, this does that also. That's two things. And now a third, third thing that I'll elaborate on is a little later that uh, <clears throat> traveling is supposed to, nothing is supposed to be able to travel faster than the speed of light. Einstein's principle of relativity proves that. But, okay, it says, if you say nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, I am changing that to, I'm adding two words. The two words are be perceived. Nothing can be perceived to travel faster than the speed of light. And, and I will back that up with a simple statement like, if I, if I could accelerate that, I'll say two Gs, uh, and all I need is a wristwatch that, that has batteries that'll last for five years, and, and a fish scale that goes up to three or four pounds have a one pound mass. If I'm going to one G, 
inside this spaceship, the scale should read 1G. If I'm going to 2Gs, it's, the weight should weigh 2 pounds. If I set it for 2 pounds and I go for 353 days, I'm at the speed of light. Uh, and, uh, and to go to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, uh, which is 4.3 light years away, um, you'd have to get up actually to roughly the, twice the speed of sound after two days at 2Gs. Then you've got to turn around and slow yourself down so you don't zip by it at two times the speed of light. And then you spend a year in orbit taking data on, on Alpha Centauri. Then you have to speed back up and then speed back down. And after five years, you're back home. Your wife is still there. Your kids are there. Maybe two of them graduated from college by now or something like that. So, and, and I'm saying that uh, if someone tried to track, if they says, we're going to track Mr. Fial out there, and that's fine when I'm going at fourth the speed of light, half the speed of light, and three fourths the speed of light, but what happens when I go faster than the speed of light? If they're using radar, I'm going like this, and the radar can't even catch me. So there's no way they can perceive my actual speed once I go past the speed of light, uh, whether you use a laser beam or r radar beam, whatever. And so uh, uh, that basically proves that, uh, th that it should be altered to say nothing can be perceived to travel faster than the speed of light. Now, basically, I've converted downward motion to downward force to horizontal motion. I've converted uniform rotary motion to unidirectional linear motion. That's two things. And I built a, a good case for something can travel faster than the speed of light, but you can't measure it. That's three things. And so they're wrong on all things. And I, I'm saying that if, if they're wrong on all three things, and I've established, done two of them, and the third one, I build a good case for it, then, then no one should claim that, that a device with inertial propulsion cannot produce a force. Uh, if you can produce a force, and I don't know how to do it, if you can produce a force, that'll accelerate something. Then if you have enough energy, like solar panels, you can have sustained acceleration. Once you have sustained acceleration, you can have travel to the stars then. Uh, set your acceleration, I'll say, for two Gs, and go to Alpha Centauri. So, uh, um, <clears throat> now another thing. <clears throat> if, if someone was inspired by what I have done to be able to be more subtle than myself and develop a force, that would be great. Then they can have sustained acceleration. And then if, if they use zero point energy, for example, and we know that that's going to happen because there's a dozen of these lectures here uh, at this conference show that z they tap into zero point energy, but it's going to take someone more subtle to control it and, and power a rocket ship. But in one or two decades, they should have zero point energy and hopefully a device that produces sustained acceleration. At that point, you could have travel to the stars, not just Alpha Centauri or, uh, and so forth. So uh, <clears throat> now, now let me see. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go through some slides now. Um, let's see. John, could you could you run the twelve slides right now, please? Okay, that's a that's a picture of of uh, different pictures of this. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. And at this point, I'll actually, I'll actually dwell on them, but first I'll zip through them. 
just to show you. Now, I want to do it over once more, John. Can you start that? John, start, start the slides over once more. <clears throat> yeah. Now this is a this is a very high precision. It's called a super high precision gyro. It's the rotor is balanced to ten parts in a million, which is great, and it's suitable for these applications. But the rest of this device is very very crude. Uh, this uh, traction ring is such a high precision device. It's actually a hoop for crocheting. It's made out of it's made out of pretty good plastic, and I had access to it. Actually, I went to a store and bought bought seven of them. That was all they had. And this here is just a a brass a brass bar, and this is a, a three sixteenths aluminum tubing, and these are simple wheels. Uh, they they have a lot of friction. I could put bearings in them, but I'd have to machine out the holes, and so I built what I could. And <clears throat> it's uh, looking at this. It's obvious that Mattel could build a toy, uh, and a radio-controlled toy, and it could do it for twenty-five dollars, or do a high-class one for fifty dollars. And so I. After this is over, I plan to go to Boeing, NASA, DARPA, and Mattel. And maybe I'll start with Mattel, but uh, I have to have a good video to show them and, uh, so that they see that it's, it's real. But uh, you can see that, now this is a piecemeal, but uh, there was a machinist, a friend of my son's, he, he, he has three CNC machines. And he was going to build me what I call a unibody one. This frame would, could, be, could be hollow and lighter than plastic, and, and there would be a post in the middle. It would all be unibody, what I call unibody, like some of the cars. And at, with only two weeks to go, he backed out. Uh, he wanted to be a full, if he did that, he wanted to be a full partner. And by the way, these, these inventions have three inventors. There's myself. Our, my son John and his son John Arthur because they've been with me all the way since 1995 on this project and so uh, he, he thought he could just hey if I want to if I want to take half a day and build you something I want to be a full partner and so I had to start from scratch uh, and, and I threw this together so <clears throat> that's a kind of a history there I'll Whoops, did I hit the wrong one? There. This is just a different view of the same thing. Another, okay, you can see it's on a track that's calibrated. I, my memory's not that great. That's calibrated either in inches or kilometers or light years. I just, I just forgot. Uh, I, I, I'd like to say also, actually you haven't seen it well, I'll, I'll say that a little bit later. These are just different views of it. There's an aspect of the gyro, and and uh, I had a. I'll back up. There's a like quarter inch wide or half inch wide traction wheel, and and it rides on this. Uh, it rides on the rim. <clears throat> it rides on this rim, which is three sixteenths of an inch wide. And unless it's so precise, now there's a little bit of flexing in here. And I used to have a one eighth inch wide wheel here and it could either slip inside or slip outside. So I had to resort to, this here's a very, very expensive, I bought it off of a little toy car. Uh, and so, uh, <clears throat> so, okay, that's, that's that. And okay, that's the end of those now. Now I'd like to show the video, uh, John, the, the well, video. Part of why he's making the points that he's making is that you can also do this too. This is another technology that you can do at home. There's, this is not, sometimes knowing the path through the forest 
is very hard to find. A lot of the settlers that took the Oregon Trail, 90% of them perished on the trail until they finally got the first path made. Once the first path is made, then the fatalities. Now, the freeway that follows that route, if they have more than 50 a year, there's a Senate investigation with the D Department of Transportation. The people that are coming up with, while we're booting this video uh, that are pioneering all these different technologies, um, they're finding that path through the forest, but we're finding out that once you find that path, uh, it's actually quite easy. And Harvey, the points that he's making here is that you can build this at home. You ready, Harvey? Right. And anyone that builds it at home is successfully, they owe me a dish of ice cream. <laughs> now, is this the first or the second video, John? This, this is the second one, sir. Is it? Okay. Now, we can it's run the designed, other one. It's designed for just one speed, and it doesn't have a motor, so it slows down. And it, this, this happens to be the first video, John, but that's okay. That's okay, Will. But you can see it moves forward about two inches and backward about an inch. And, uh, and that's because for half of the cycle, it's in traction. The other half, it's in, it's in precession. When it's in traction, it has full inertia, or you might say full mass. And uh, some people erroneously say that at that point, um, so my mistake, that was the first video. This is the second one. OK, yeah. Here's the procession, traction, procession, traction, procession, traction. Now, this thing actually isn't working very good. But when it gets down to the right speed, then it starts moving. You can see that. And <clears throat> OK, that, OK, this, this half is traction, no, procession, that half is is traction. Uh, this is traction, procession, traction, procession. And uh, <clears throat> during traction, it has full inertia, also called full mass. During procession, it has only about half of its inertia. Some people would say half its mass, but you can see the mass is there, but a mass can have variable inertia depending on the acceleration that it's, that it's subjected to it. So uh, um, OK. Let's see. <laughs> Here's something. I, I just want to mention this. If, if you got going up toward the speed of light with inertial propulsion, <clears throat> in the speed of sound, as you approach the speed of sound, the noise of the aircraft is going ahead of you. But pretty soon, when you approach the speed of sound, the noise, you go, the noise accumulates in a big noise front. And you enter that, that's a sonic boom. And it can shatter your aircraft if you don't know what you're doing. You got to go through it rapidly. You got to have enough rigidity to now. As you pass through the speed of light, and I don't believe that that's all relative, <laughs> but if you were passing through the speed of light, and if there was an ether boom, and now this is, this is humor, if you had headlights on your craft, and, and you were catching up to the light beam, and it was going to be super brilliant, which might burn you up, then right before you pass through the ether boom, turn your headlights off. <laughs> <laughs> OK, but I don't think that'll be a problem. Uh, and uh, OK, so let's see. OK, here we, here we go through the, the, the slide. There's, that, is the, uh, that is the very simplest. Here it's in traction. And there, since it's in procession, it doesn't actually need anything there. The one reason there's something there is if it falls out of procession, it'll drop down and bust. So, but that's the simplest. It has one moving part and almost almost nothing to it. And so, uh, yeah, I was told that all of you have a photographic memory and can read 10,000 words a minute. So, 
some of these slides are going to uh, zip through. Uh, that's, a, that's a version, a different version. And here, this is a table of contents for the whole thing. Now here's where, uh, here's where you can read 10,000 words a minute and just, okay. Here's a, an example of a vertical motion one that has to be tested out in the space station. And here is, uh, this is the abstract for the, uh, you see, the, whoops, whoops, I blew it. Uh, can you get me back, John? I must have pushed the wrong button. Okay, the abstract. You can see it says, you know, no wonder I had the wrong device. To move an object up and down, it should say, well, actually, I, I modified it. I put inertial propulsion device to move an object up and down. This is the abstract. And the abstract says that there's two devices. One uses gravity, and the other you cannot use gravity. It depends on inertia, which is tied to the ether. And the, the establishment physicists and everyone now believe that the inertia of anything, see if I, if I bump into something, it, I, I, I have to push it, it feels heavy. And, and its inertia, every atom in it is tied to every other atom in the universe instantaneously. It's called quantum entanglement. And so uh, my body, every atom in my body is tied to every other atom in you and in the whole universe. And that gives us inertia. If I push you and you're on roller skates, you'll keep moving because you have inertia. And, uh, and so I'm just saying that quantum entanglement, that's a new thing. And <clears throat> back in 1957, when I was in college, uh, um, I wrote this article, Gravity, a New Means of Communication, question mark. Okay, and if it was instantaneous, I'm going to republish that article. It was about 14 pages, and uh, I'm going to give it a subtitle called Quantum Entanglement, or Communication by Quantum Entanglement. About 10 years ago, I thought about issue, uh, issuing a, uh, getting a patent on a device to communicate to the planets instantaneously using quantum entanglement. But there's a lot of laboratory doing research. The Russians have established, they've quantumly entangled like over 180 kilometers and now they're getting ready to do it between two satellites which will be a thousand miles apart. And so uh, it's, it, quantum entanglement is established. And so, uh, and, and this, all the scientists used to say that gravity acts at the speed of light. And I, when I went to Hughes Aircraft, uh, when I graduated from North Dakota State University, I had a Howard Hughes Master of Science Fellowship to get a master's degree in double E at Caltech. And I, and I worked for Hughes. Hughes is the one that offered it. So I spent three and a half years at Hughes. And I, I started a program to measure the speed of gravitational interaction at Hughes. And I discussed this with Dr. Richard Feynman, and he pointed out to me that, well, he, he convinced me that it's, it's at the speed of light and that it's, it's impossible using any of my techniques to try to measure it. And by the way, I might mention, <clears throat> my wife used to come to me w to these meetings with me, and two years ago she came in a wheelchair. Now she's at home with 24-7 nursing care and uh, uh, she wishes she could be here, and I wish she could be here, but, uh, <clears throat> but uh, um, I forget what I was going to say. Uh, well, I'll, oh yeah, at, at Hughes, I, after Dr. Feynman convinced me erroneously that you can't measure it. Well, that may be true, you can't measure it, uh, but, but it, 
it is true that <clears throat> we got about 15 10 15 minutes left. fine I'll, okay it's true that that it's instantaneous and everyone accepts it and and don't try to measure it if it's instantaneous you just got to sort of accept it so uh, I, I stopped that program after about a year at Hughes which it was it is noteworthy that Hughes Aircraft would sponsor a program to measure the speed of gravitational interaction. Even though my old professor told me I was crazy. Uh, okay, this is more of the table of contents. So you can use your photographic memory in 2,000 words a minute to speed read it. The units, when you're working with inertial propulsion and there's no force involved, I had to invent new units, really. So the textbooks of the future well, like there's, there's force and there's mass and there's acceleration and, and uh, certain terms like if force, if this doesn't produce a force, I'll call it I, uh, uh, italicized letter I, lowercase italicized I force or I velocity and, uh, or I, I acceleration and so forth. units definition of a gyro I, I want to say that a gyro is a more comp I use the term rotor a gyro is a more complicated device and here those 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 uh, little things those little chips are solid state gyros believe it or not they're solid state gyros the technology has advanced so much there's another this these are different versions of uh, that for the traction ring it used a v-groove like like a v-belt on a on a engine and this here has a, a one a lower deck and an upper deck which is inverted so that it reduces the height it's uh, and these wheels here ensure that both rotors are turning at the same speed this another version, this is another version, and this is a, another version. Now, it turns out that, I'll, I'll try to back up. Okay, if you take a rotor <clears throat> and cut the diameter down, and if you cut the diameter half and double the width so that the mass stays the same, if you keep that going, cut it down and widen, cut it down and widen it pretty soon, you end up with, I call it a rolling pin rotor. And that has, that has special properties that the velocity that can achieve is the square of the velocity of the other version. And so, but this is all to be implemented and tested in, in laboratories. Uh, here's another, different versions. Uh, I, time is short, so I'm going to just zip through them. This shows the different. This is a uh, um, solid solid disc rotor, and this is a hollow disc rotor or thin disc rotor. This is this is the very very first kludge that I built. It it went plus or minus. It went 60 degrees and came back. It uh, it would traction 60 degrees and and precess in the air back. It, it, it hit a down ramp and and it actually worked that my first video is of that that was I did that in 1990 2005 or 2006 here's some waveforms for the different uh, here you need your photographic memory and these are different waveforms to hopefully they'll show you that I knew what I was doing now we start in the VMT ones and there's different versions of it. I'll back up one step, I think. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is a particular version. It's called, I called it the Fiala Verticals Drive, F, V, S, D or something. Uh, but it, it's, it has significant characteristics. Here's one using rolling pin rotors. 
Uh, and here's another version of it. Uh, in fact, in a version like this, in a version like that, <clears throat> since it, the base here is not needed, that's just to help orient, orient the, the viewer. Uh, that, that doesn't need to be there because it's used in outer space in, in orbit. And <clears throat> it uses, instead of gravity, it uses a forcing torque. So there's a motor and it torques these discs one way and those discs the other way. And so that the chassis, if you're torquing it, the chassis will start to turn in the opposite direction. So this has the property that the torques are balanced. And so in any, any device, the torques have to be balanced. Here, there's two different units. Uh, one is going in one direction, the other is going the other, so the torques are balanced. They don't have to be on top of each other. They can be anywhere on the same plane. Uh, Dr. Eric Lathwaite pointed that out. Same thing here. Uh, um, it's like stuck on figure 26, John. There's 27, 28. And there's, there's the waveforms for here how it slowly advances. Uh, more waveforms. Um, see, you can become a student of this if you, I'd, I'd recommend picking up at least the blue patent. Or, now here's a totally unique, uh, uh, up at the top is a two yoke common pivot point. But this is a patentable device. People told me I should just patent it, but a patent cost a hell of a lot of money and after a couple of years you got to pay a thousand twelve hundred dollars maintenance fee and stuff like that and and so uh, anyhow that is built like there's four rotors some can be up and some can be down and they mustn't bump into each other so those humps are here so that this doesn't bump into it and this has a downward hump so it doesn't so that's a very unique uh, yoke design and here's this just shows that a VMT can move sideways in orbit. Here's more waveforms. This shows that you could have like eight, instead of showing the rotors, you can have eight, up to eight, I'll say, all on the same pivot point. Here's another design now. Now here's a special design. This is the first, the only drawing <clears throat> that shows two rotors. Now there could be two more at right angles, and uh, but I, it turns out that my solid 3D SolidWorks uh, um, th thing expired, and I I re renewed it and expired again, and a, a full uh, set of 3D SolidWorks cost $5,500, and so I just didn't have money, and it you have to learn to program it. There's obviously a lot of good programmers around, but I'm no longer one of them. Uh, okay, here's more, uh, just more v versions. <clears throat> That's the simplest possible version. I want to make sure. Okay. There's a cone-shaped rotor. Uh, it turns out that a, a hollow, like a, a thin rim rotor, is far better than a solid disc rotor. And if you had a cone-shaped one, guess what? You can make a flying saucer out of it. Uh, now, at, at this point, I'll back up a teeny bit. Notice that this device comes to a dead stop in each cycle. And this is designed only to go like a... a three feet per minute or something like that. But if you, and I don't know how to design it to go 5,000 miles an hour, but you see the UFOs that they claim go 5,000 miles an hour, turn a square corner or do anything. Well, these devices, they can, they can, when they're moving internally, it comes to a dead stop. So you could 
turn a square corner, you could reverse your direction. You can do the same things that these UFOs does, only it's at a much, much slower speed. Now, who knows what they'll, you know, they, a John Deere tractor has a two-cylinder engine. They now have 12-cylinder 12 12 Rolls-Royce engines, and, and who knows what spending 10 or $100 million would do for something like this. These are just different. Now, here's a, a very interesting figure. <clears throat> This plots the mass as a function of the speed. At the speed of light, Einstein says that the mass turns infinite. But what happens when you pass the speed of light? The mass drops way down, and if you're going, if pretty soon the mass approaches zero. And so if you could be smart enough to get up to this speed and cross over to this point somehow, without having to go uh, to an infinite mass. Now, I don't believe this infinite mass thing, but I plotted it just like Einstein's equation. But I don't think they've examined that the mass turns way down as the speed increases. And that, that's a good thing. Now here's another figure, if I can get it. I'm trying, John, I'm trying to get the next figure. Uh, Whoops. Uh, okay, here's another figure. This shows, mm, can you go to the next figure? It was there for a second. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll try it. There, okay, I wanna dwell on this one. This shows that the kinetic energy, uh, the kinetic energy goes up like this and, and uh, as you approach the speed of light, the kinetic energy drops off, but it has an asymptote here, then it's asymptotic at infinity. And, uh, and uh, it, well, it's very interesting, the kinetic energy. Um, and that's the end of, the, of that slide show. And I think, I think that uh, concludes my presentation now. Well, I'll, I'll show you the device. Yes. You know what? We're going to hold off on taking a couple of questions because we only got a yeah. few minutes left, and uh, you've only got three minutes left to demonstrate okay. your drive. Okay. Uh, so we're going to hold off for just a moment. Okay. Oh. I want to show you how one actually works. Now, this, this here uh, doesn't have a motor to run at a constant speed. If it did, it could keep going. But it, it go, we speed it up to faster, and then when it slows down to the right speed, then it starts moving. So it's a little tricky. <clears throat> Got to lift it off there now. Okay. That should be good enough. <clears throat> Is your finger touching the rotor? I touched it once. That's okay. My fault. I apologize. It's a very humble device compared to a lot of other things, but you can see it moves forward maybe three inches and back two inches or something. But the, and you can see that there's a point of a dead stop. Now, if it had a second rotor, when one is trying to back up a little, the, the first one would be, so it would never stop. And if you had four of them, uh, <clears throat> oh, good idea. Yeah, good idea. So if you had, if you had four of them, it would go just like that. I'll, I'll say uh, it would go 10 feet a minute or something like that. And so
This is an extremely elementary demonstration device that if you look at the current VMT, <coughs> even the schooled physicists, the church ecumenical scientific community at large no, have I'll, a hard I'll, time understanding I'll it. Explain but this for a minute, right now. here, as it rotates, it floats around through one half of the, uh, of the orbit, then the other half, that wheel, that traction wheel, <coughs> is reacting against the frame. Now, I, I want to mention that, that this rotor is so heavy that it's supposed to precess here like that, I'm exaggerating, and then traction. Then it's supposed to precess, and actually I, I, I gave it a little lift here, so it, like a 3 16 of an inch, so that, that it helped trigger the precession. And then it's supposed to crawl up a one degree incline, but this rotor is so heavy that it, it drops out of precession like this. And let's say it goes only 45 degrees instead of 180. That's like a, that's like a four cylinder engine working on only one cylinder. And, and in, in production, we would have only one half of a gimbal holding it. This has one, two, three, this has four very heavy duty gimbals. And that makes it, uh, what, is it speeding up? Or? Yes, sir, it is. Oh. Yeah. Okay. When it reaches its design speed, then it starts to move. Okay, so I'm going to move it back just okay. here. Yeah. Fine. <clears throat> but it, the, the, it doesn't precess a full 180 degrees, which it, if it did, you'd see a marvelous demonstration, but it precesses only for less than, uh, less than half of 180 degrees and and uh, and at, at first it, it wasn't moving because the rotor is actually floating off the traction ring. It's not actually touching it. It's just sitting there oscillating, and that's why it oscillates back and forth. But as it begins to settle down, so that that traction wheel actually touches uh, the <coughs> traction ring, now as you, and now you can see it now it begins to motivate. But if, when, you, if you picture yourself in a boat with a bucket of water, you throw it, the bucket of water out over, you know, out the back, you move forward. Now, if you can pick up that water again without reaching out and pulling it back into the boat, you could throw it out the back of the boat again and you go even farther. This okay. is the way you get it back without having to reach out and pull now, it back. Now, I'll entertain questions. You can, uh, yeah, we got time for one or two questions at the, at the question mic. I'd like to ask a question of whether this microphone is on or not. I guess everybody saw the typo on page seven or am I anything? Well, never mind. So we've corresponded on this before, and um, my master's thesis at MIT was on the mode shapes of rotating objects. And to get that answer right, you have to write an 18 degree of freedom tensor. And it's, you know, fairly complicated and it takes just a long time to solve it, and it's a top-down, and it's the same Lagrangian formulation or Newtonian formulation, either one. And all of the papers that you've sent to me didn't have the clever Feynman simplification of starting out plotting the uh, center of mass and then proceeding to the next things that you would do, which is plot out the, uh, the mass tensor at each position, and then the linear momentum tensor at each position, and then the angular momentum tensor at each position. And one of the virtues of that formulation is that it points the way that when you do the full tensor formulation, the first thing that happens is you get to cancel out most of them, which is the happy part of the math, but knowing them in advance is a real simplification. So uh, I'd like to know whether you've ever published a paper or written a formulation that uses this Feynman simplification. Um, I haven't done that. Uh, I've, I've studied it, and I, uh, uh, I'm a little hard of hearing, and I didn't understand everything you said. But uh, if, you, if you study the figures there, they'll answer probably half of your questions, the figures in the, in the patent and uh, the blue copy. I'd encourage anyone seriously interested, go get a copy of the blue patent. There's 
only a few left there. And, but I, I know there's, uh, if you're willing to help me on some of those math, the math that you talked about, uh, I'm willing to, uh, that'd, be, that'd be great. Uh, I no longer have the capacity to, my, my schedule is overloaded for the next few years and, and I'll only be here a few more years. So if someone wants to do some math on it for me, I'd welcome that, so. Well, I'm pretty sure no one else in the room has an overloaded schedule. <laughs> oh, oh they hey, how many of you here last night remember the Einstein syndrome? <laughs> he knew special rel relativity and rel special relativity work, but he couldn't do the math. Who did the math? Anybody? His <laughs> wife, yes. And remember that <laughs> everything, merits. everything that Fred Astaire did, Ginger Rogers did also. Backward on high heels. <laughs> yes. So there's, a, there's somebody in their life that helps out. One of the applications you may not have thought of is that a, uh, all chemical rockets, their center of mass stays on the launch pad. And so it's unbelievably inefficient, just, you know, 0.001% efficient. <clears throat> and right. they use a single mass tensor. That's linear acceleration. But there may be a particle trajectory based on this, or the, the math of this, that actually increases the efficiency. So you have a curly Q particle trajectory or something. So that's one of the virtues of doing the full formulation is that uh, on the one hand, you can design uh, the device, and on the other hand, you might find other applications. That, that, that's true. And uh, uh, once, once a rocket ship gets out in orbit, if they fire up their rockets, like he said, the center mass cannot move. If the rocket ship moves this way, and it weighs 10 ton, for example, it's going to move slowly. And that exhaust mass is moving at uh, Mach 10 or something, and it's, it's going to move 1,000, 10,000 miles away. And if you take the center of mass of all that exhaust at any point in time, you plot that center mass, and you take the rocket ship, which is moving slowly, you take its center mass, and you plot the center of mass of both of those, it didn't move at all. It cannot move without the application of an external force. And so uh, uh, that's a good point, Rob. Uh, okay, we have, to, we have one question left. We have to be very candid about this and take it very quickly, please. Harvey, is there a variable acceleration in your design? Variable acceleration. acceleration. There's no acceleration. Actually, there is. <clears throat> At the start of each one, the, the rate of precession comes up to speed and theoretically stays for most of 180 degrees and then it then it drops back down to zero so there's acceleration deceleration but that's only in the in the precession and the vehicle as such uh, outside of uh, over over a variety of cycles it does not accelerate it operates at its design speed now this is not to say that you can't design one for variable speed but once you get to the maximum speed, then you cannot exceed that for a given design. But it, it could be made to operate at, at anything less than the, but this is a single speed one, and it doesn't even have a motor to hold it at that speed. Uh, when it decays down to the right speed, then it starts moving. And uh, it's the humblest thing there is, but it um, shows that it works. May I add something to that, Harvey? Pardon? May I add something to that? Yes. A rotor, when it's acted upon, when it's acting as a gyroscope, and it begins to process, it's instantaneous, zero to whatever full velocity there is. There, so the concept of acceleration, there is or isn't any. Uh, you can say there's full acceleration, but it happens instantaneously, literally. And when it reacts, it doesn't slowly begin to react. It's instantaneous. Now, that's what this demonstration is. Now, the VMT, you can actually speed up the precession or the rotor drive system so that you can control the velocity. And that, there would, but that's a different unit. This, this is not that unit. Now, that unit has that. But this unit, there is no, you can say there is complete acceleration and there's zero acceleration. Uh, under, does that make sense? It depends on your initial boundary uh, condition, right? Exactly. I'm okay, at, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Harvey, this cart and Harvey are going to roll out to the, uh, to the hallway there. We're getting ready for Susan Price. And uh, this is Harvey Fiala and Inertia Propulsion.
Okay. Okay, we'll see you all.